Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, your official home on Saturday midday. Great to see yes. you all again. I love that this is working out. I love that we're seeing everybody and coming together and creating this wonderful community. Ooh, look at all these people. Amplifying this wonderful community. This has been such an honor to be able to facilitate this. I, I wish I could see the class. Sorry. Sorry, Ethan. Keep going. Are you, <laughs> you, can you see, are you missing something or? No, I'm, I'm here. I'm seeing stuff. What I meant can to you say. Can see everybody? I can't see everybody. No, that's okay. I oh, see it, like what view are you row. using? I see a top row. Oh, there's, that's there's all right. Gallery yeah, view. That's okay. yeah choose, choose a gallery view if you want to. Um, yeah. You should be able to see more people. You'll, well, I'll just you'll, uh, uh, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, it's okay. So, okay. Ethan, I, I just wanted to say that. Well, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say hi to Bill Monroe. He's looking very. Uh, oh, he's looking very ominous hey. in his hoodie over there. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 a secret gangster. We've, okay. we've got like uh, we, we've got like three and a half feet of snow uh, outside. So oh, I'm just awesome. It's it's uh around hovering around zero today. Nice, love it. Oh. I'm I'm that? really truly grateful. I'm in Southern California with the door open and the window open. It's um, seventy and sunny here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What were you so going to say, David? I, I I want to say before we start that I've known Nick for about twenty years, and for the first half of that, I was really intimidated by him because he he knows so much, and I felt like I was like a country bumpkin compared to this guy. And he also had this cool kind of like 50s jazz musician, nothing rattles me kind of vibe. And it's like, Jesus, who is this dude? And then I found out he makes a good living in the piano business, living out in the middle of Chitlin Switch, Idaho. I mean, <laughs> some little town way up in the mountains in Arizona. It's like, wow. Yeah. And I started going to classes and reading his articles and it's like, this guy's a master. And he wow. knows a lot about a lot of different stuff. He knows a lot about a action. He's an engineer, man. How intimidating. Yeah. Um, he knows a, <laughs> he knows a lot about actions. He knows about soundboards. He knows a lot about a lot of stuff. So use him in this hour and ask him whatever yeah. questions you want to ask. Yeah, I'd like to have questions. Yeah, I'll yeah. give a, I'll give an intro yeah. here, and then we'll dive into it. Okay, sound good? Cool. So, yeah. just to remind everybody, you are here for Piano Tech Radio Hour. It's being brought to you by Piano Tech Distance Master Masterclasses, which is an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass dot com when you get to the home page there you can uh, click the link to find out about our upcoming convention which our guest today nick will be teaching at so we're very excited to have him dive even deeper uh coming up in march yeah and i'll give a little bit of a a bio of nick and then we'll we'll get rolling uh, nick combines a formal engineering background with over 40 years of hands-on experience in piano design manufacturing and rebuilding he has authored numerous articles for the piano trade and has been a featured instructor at piano technical seminars all over the US. His business currently revolves around rebuilding and manufacturing custom sound boards for the piano yep. rebuilding trade. So welcome, welcome to the program today. Thank you. Good to have you here, Nick. Good to be here. Thank you, uh, Ethan and, and uh, David for inviting me in. So how do you want to begin? My pleasure. Anyone well, why don't here? you give us a little bit of a maybe and maybe it's changed. So either give us a sense of like what what's your day to day 
now, or if now is not much of a day-to-day, what has been your day-to-day in terms of what you're working on and within the piano industry? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. My day-to-day now is I, I, I bake bread. I do a lot of bed breaking. Bread, Got bake. <laughs> uh, semi-retired, but I still have my finger in the pie considerably. I still have a couple of soundboards coming in. I've got a Steinway B out in the shop with a new board and a new action. And uh, so yeah. I'm still very much involved. But day to day, you know, I'm going to say 20, 30 years ago, was, you know, heavily, heavily involved in uh, shop work, action overhauls, uh, you know, a lot of voicing, a lot of voice. Well, it's, you know, when you do these big jobs and you put new hammers on, you're, uh, you're voicing all the time. And um, especially 25 or 30 years ago. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Absolutely. But then yeah. continuing you know, all through all through this time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If, if we just talk about the voicing thing for now, just just in, the, in a couple of minutes here, we'll get back to it, I think. Is I learned early on that when people love the way their piano sounds, even if I don't, I don't try and talk them out of that. And also, I mean, I'll point some things out. Are you really happy with this? You know, the way it sounds. Um, and I'll play some notes. And I might say, to me, this sounds a little bright. And no, oh, no, we love it. Everybody that's played the piano is love it and so forth. Uh, I don't push too hard. But when they tell me, I used to love the way this Yamaha sounded, you know, five years ago or something. And now it's I can't play soft. I can't do this. I can't do that. That's when I that's when I dive in. I've been explaining this this is why, show them the hammer and so forth. But we're really working against a lot of factors there because it's very, very much a subjective do, do, do. issue. David? David had a question? Uh, yeah, what were you do say, you David? Show t- yeah. My question was at that point <laughs> when the people say these hammers are shrieky, they're too bright, do you actually do something to to knock them down, to knock one down a little bit and say. Well, that's that's a little scary. That's a good idea. If you if, but if you make if you make such a change to one hammer in the middle of the scale, then they're stuck with it, right? So what well, I what, that's why you got to make a a small yet noticeable change, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I make a dramatic yeah. difference. Basically, what I do is I used to carry a thin um, hanky with me. And I would pull the action out. I put the hanky on top of the hammers, right? And believe it or not, you could you could play, and the change is instant. They're like, "Wow, that's a lot mellower," you know, than than it was. In some cases, if you play the note enough with that hanky on top of there, they can hear that's the tone. I want something more like that, you know. Then you're home free. Then you can explain, okay, I can get it to there, but the reason this is what I'm going to have to do, and then you start talking about the money, the time, and, and all the rest of it. In some cases, I've been able to, if I, if I didn't have my hanky with me, I had some sort of cloth that I could actually put under the string and bring it back up around and make sure that it was under the hammer and then hit that. And that was just enough to make a change in the way that in particular note sounded. I just wanted to show them that a softer impact, quote unquote, uh, it's going to make a big change in the in the tone. So that's one of my techniques wow. of getting them there. But that's a I, great I, risk-free idea. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, but I've had situations, and I'm sure that you that voiced a lot too, where husband and wife both play, and wife is better. Let's say you know she knows she's a more accomplished than than dad. And so, you know, where does this go? And I've had instances where I've voiced it and mom loved it and dad hated it. The reason dad hated it is because he doesn't know how to dig in. When we voice hammers, we're putting that variable sense of, um, you know, the, the, the uh, what, are we, what are we talking about here? The hammer hits the string and it has a variable sense of compression to it. So the harder right. that hammer hits the string, the higher the parcels are going to come out. Now, an accomplished pianist right. knows that. They know how to dig in and get that when they need it. Right. But someone that's not that accomplished, they don't. 
And so to them, their normal playing comes out too dull, too soft, too mellow. For them. Right. It's mezzo all the time for those it's people. It's mezzo all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have to voice for those particular tastes, which in a sense complicates the thing considerably because who else is going to play this piano? Is it just you? Or do you have, you know, is this going to be used? You have this big room. You've got this Steinway B here. Are you going to have a lot of parties? Do you entertain a lot? In other words, do you have the professors from the university coming over? Are they going to play it? Is it that sort of thing. Because at that point, I will almost have to so, insist. I'm going to have to voice this to a performance level. And, you know, we're all going to have to, <laughs> going to, have to live with that. Because I guarantee if I bring this down too far, somebody else is not going to like it. The players are not going to like it. Yes. What were you going to say, Dave? Yeah. I was going to say, you, you present like a doctor, like somebody who really knows what's going on and that you have the, have the answer that you can, whatever the issue is, you can sit there and communicate with them to a high enough level so that they can feel comfortable with you doing whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. That's the secret of that situation, I believe. Don't you? Well, I, that you've I, learned how to yeah. be in relationship with your clients? Yeah. And I, and I think that's what I love about this business so much is that it's so personal. Um, it's great in that regard. You know, we really have this one-on-one -on -one relationship. These people invite us into their homes. We meet their no. dogs and cats. We meet their kids. They invite us back. You know, I know. Over, and over again, it, it's a wonderful relationship. It's one of the yep. things I've always appreciated, appreciated about being in this business. But yeah, I think in all of the various disciplines, if we talk about, you know, pianos in three big boxes, let's say we have, we've got the box itself. We have the belly that we're concerned with or, or should be, we should know something about that. Even if we're just tuners, Yeah, um, we have the action. How does it play? And then we have the sound. How does that factor in? In other words, obviously the tuning is the first part of the tone. Um, and then we got to work with the hammer. So we have three big areas right there. And in every one of those areas, it's only a small handful of things all of us need to know and can know in explaining at least the basics of what's going on. You know, piano tone really begins in the belly. Uh, we all know that. You can't get out of it from a hammer if it's not in the piano to begin with. So there's a big, big area no. right there. Well, how do we talk about that? I mean, obviously, it's very, it can get very confusing because you have a seven foot piano next to a five foot one piano. Obviously, they're not going to sound the same and can't. The bellies are very different. No, but, but the bellies still have what you everything do. in common with each other. They do. And what you can do, what I do, what I've grown to do have over 30 odd years, 40 odd years, I pluck this, I pluck strings mm -hmm. and have them listen to the to the decay, the sustain and decay. And right. I show them if I pluck a string that's functioning at the top of its efficiency, I say, this is how every string on this piano is supposed to sound. And mm -hmm. it pretty much does because the sound board's functioning, sound board's functioning efficiency. Listen. Mm -hmm. It has blooms. And, you know, people can hear that. Everybody mm -hmm. that I've ever showed it to can hear it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, 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 it heals the sting of you're going to do what to my piano and my hammers and my whatever. Jesus, you know, heals that sting a little bit. Well, a hammer, obviously plucking the string is a good idea because in fact, not only that, also for the partials. And one of the things I like mm -hmm. to do, someone says the the piano is, well, I actually, I do this anyway, just in terms of voicing and, and just getting a sense of what the piano is compared to what I'm getting out of the hammer. Now, we know the hammer strikes the string at a certain distance from the capo bar or the agraph. And what I like to do is just sort of estimate that distance, whatever it is. And then I go to the back of the string where the bridge is. 
and I estimate the same distance. So in other words, I want to get that strike point, but I'm, I'm putting it between the bridge pins and the front of the piano. See what I mean? Right? So if I know it's hitting at an inch, yeah. Yeah. the camera's hitting at an inch, I go to the back and I figure an inch right there. Then I take a, a, a um, plectrum, which I have a, a long, sort of longish maple uh, wedge that I made that's like a, a big long guitar pick. It's got some flex to it. And I'll strum that string right there, right at that point. And if I hear all the high partials coming out, I say, well, okay, it's in there. It's in the box, as, as some of us say. Then if I play the hammer and I don't hear those same high partials, then I know the hammer's not giving out what the piano has to give. So that's another way I communicate with customers, but mostly, you know, myself, if I'm in the shop, but obviously, you know, you know, a field setting mm -hmm. too. So that's another little trick that, uh, so that I work with. Just to reiterate. You know, a hammer striking a string. Keep going, David. That, that was Ethan. I was just no, going to say Ethan, to reiterate. No, so you just look to the point where the hammer hits the string and then you use a pick or something like that to pluck it there to say this is the place where the tone should be coming from and compare that with how it sounds when the hammer yeah, hits the string. Yeah. Yes, this is mostly, most of the concern is gonna be in the so-called melody area, right? Uh -huh. And also you have accessibility. So you can't really, in the front part by the A-graph, the dampers, everything's in the way. So you can't really strum it there, right? Got it. So all I wanna do is figure out what is the distance more or less from where that hammer's hitting the string. If it's an inch, then I go to the back of the string and I figure an inch from the bridge pins out. I see. So in other words, I'm, pl I'm, I'm pluck it there. Yeah, pluck it there. Right. Right. So, okay. So because the sense, dampers would be dampers the dampers would be in the way. Hand. Right. Got it. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. So that That's brings amazing. up a lot of stuff. I can hear it right there. So listen to the, all the pipe. You hear all that tinkling sound and the rest of it. Um, now, granted, you know when you pluck a string with a plectrum, you're going to get a lot of high partials anyway, no matter where you do it. But it tells me it's in there. It tells me it's in the box, and that's all I need to know. At some point, there you go. There you go. Right. At some point, if the hammer gets, it needs to be harder, uh, you know, you can keep creeping up on it until you begin to hear those things kick in that you're that you're listening for. Just assuming it's too dull, too dead to begin with. Can hey, Nick? Can you talk about the absolute crucial uh, necessity of being a good diagnostician as a piano technician coming up to a piano and basically knowing in a very short period of time what's going on with it what's going on with the action what's going on with the tone what's going on with if there's any real anomalies you know can you talk about I mean, that? other than the usual other than the usual stuff in other words if the action is really bad we're going to know that instantly well sure right. i'm no i'm talking about you know like when you come up to a really good grand piano, but that's just needs a bunch of tweaking, action, regulation, tone wise, you know, to be able to, to be able to really understand what it needs in a, in a triage way. What, what's the biggest bang for the buck that could happen to this? Well, as you know, you know, you play it, you play it and you can tell immediately. So let's assume that's even, that it's in tune even, right? At least enough in tune. Um, you can tell pretty quickly if there's sort of a balance to the thing. Does the, the melody area, does it speak out? Is the bass too boomy by comparison? Right. Is it all too dead? You know, that, that yep. sort of thing. Yeah. But, but for me, the yep. first thing I want to know is, is the problem in the box or is it in the hammers? And uh, that's why I'm talking about these other things about, you know, a striking, uh, you know, plucking the string, strumming it with a stick, for not only for sustain, but also to be able to hear are there partials coming out? Because uh, a soundboard that's dead, uh, or in right. some cases, the soundboard's not dead, but the bearing is wrong. Uh, there are times when, you know, the most important part of down bearing or, or checking it is the front bearing. Is there a front bearing? Does this, you know, does a string go up to a bridge uphill, go over the bridge, and it doesn't even necessarily have to go down. That's the usual model that's in our minds, and it's rarely the case yeah. in the real world. But you want this at least to be true, right? 
if this is true, there isn't anything you can do. I mean, you know, you can regulate the action, the action, you can tune it, you can make it better than it is, but it's never going to be what it should be because you have basically negative front bearing at the bridge. So that's one of the first things I'm going to look at, right? And before I can even do that, I want to be able to tap at least a few strings down to make sure that they're they're down on the bridge. And, uh, you know, working with the, and is the, it, the bubble gauge. And is you know, that just a visual sign? Oh, you, uh, it that, can that be was my visual. question. That you do that with a bubble gauge? There's even a quicker way. You, um, I'm going to pretend. Okay, this is my this is my bread knife. All right. <laughs> Let's say I we have you a, have a bread knife and a drumstick as props. There, that's uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was hoping to, I was hoping you break out in a drum solo at some point. Could have a cowbell. <laughs> So um, if you play, careful, if this is, careful you know hitting that, the cowbell. More cowbell. Yeah, I know. It affects the sound for you guys. Yeah. Uh, more cowbell, somebody said. I know. No, no yeah, exactly. don't bang yeah, it. Yeah. Don't bang it. This, is the, top, more this cowbell. is the top of the bridge. Yeah. And you take your little six inch flexible ruler, the little steel one that we all have, right? And you place it between the strings right on the bridge top. Okay. Nikki, that tells you that. You're talking tells about you that, something. Are you talking about the one that we keep in our pocket protector? You're the one we keep. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the real nerd stuff, yes, the pocket protector. That's right. And you put it on That's the bridge the top between nerd. the strings. It's going to yeah. give you the, the plain top of the bridge, correct? Right? Now, if the string happens to be going That's off right. in this direction, this is going to be below it. This is going to be below the string if it's going off in this direction. Is that clear? Let me do it this way. Yeah. I'm really going to knock this all over. Are you, you talking see, about? You can see how strings? the ruler, the ruler, which is my knife, is below oh, the string, which is going uphill. You can get an instant sense right there. On the opposite string. Uh, if bearing is good, right, yeah. you'll see it this way. Does that make sense? Remember, this is the steel ruler. Yeah. This yes, I have. You'll see it immediately. I I bought uh, some bearing sticks from Dale Irwin, and I use a little short bearing stick. And it shows me immediately. Yeah. And you're right. It's a big, huge red flag for that piano if you're going to record it or reform on it. Or it's going to be for any serious use if the, if it's got you know, reverse front bearing. Yeah. It 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 will never sing. No, like it can't. It can't because instead of pushing down on the soundboard or even in a neutral situation, which isn't the worst case, um, but the interaction of the string to the soundboard is just all backwards. It's not it's not working right. It's constantly pulling up on that front pin. And if you would actually pull those pins out, the string would fly right over the ridge top. And so that's obviously not going to work. But that brings up, mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing about how soundboards are supposed mm -hmm. to function. And I can get into that a little bit here. I mean, you know, things become axiomatic after a while and almost. Go ahead. Question. Just again. Somebody asking. No, I, I, th I think that David just said, yeah, go ahead and, oh. and uh, continue. Yeah, yeah, I do have some things ahead, I don't really have because as we were talking, as we were saying before. Okay, I don't see David. David as we were saying before, David, you know, go, go, going back to the basics. <laughs> yeah, the, the oh. soundboard, you know, the, the, it, it floats in and floating around for a long time that that the, 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 the least bearing you put on the soundboard, practically zero bearing, the better. And if you say something long enough over and over and over again, then axiomatically we begin to say, okay, it's unquestionable. That's, that's, the, that's it. We all know, you know, you know, someone, people say, everybody knows that blank, 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 right? Or it goes yeah. without saying that blank, blank, blank. Well, it or could be conventional blank, wisdom is blank, 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 something like that. Yeah. Well, a soundboard is supposed to be compressed. They're made to be compressed. They're not made for strings to just sort of lie on there 
without pushing on the board. I mean, this is the simple physics of the matter. I mean, look at a violin for one thing. The strings, you know, they, they attack that bridge, that little skinny bridge at a very, very sharp angle and, and drop yep. down. There's supposed to be downward pressure on that spring. The soundboard is the spring. That is, if you make it right, or if the manufacturer made it right, it is a spring. It's supposed to compress. If I had a little coil spring in my hand and I went like this, I would compress that. And when I did that, what did I do? I put energy into that spring. And energy has to be put into the soundboard. Uh, how much has been, has been developed over time? And it, it's a funny thing because the piano really was invented before there were computers and before there were all sorts of, you know, heavy investigations into it with oscilloscopes and uh, various timing devices and so on. And how was it developed? How was it determined that, well, we like this one? Well, it was, you know, experiential. Um, and people's ears picked yeah. it up and said, this is what we like. This is what goes. The same thing with, with actions. Yep. Why, why is 10 millimeters, give or take a small amount, why is that the amount? Why isn't, why isn't it 15? Uh, you know, why does the hammer blow? Because that's 40, what 45 or, six, 45 or 46 millimeters. Why isn't it 72, right? Because as human beings, we exactly. respond to those numbers. Um, if we were like Goliath, you know, from, uh, from, from, from those pages, pianos wouldn't be what they are. They'd be a totally different thing. So how much pressure has to be put on a soundboard basically has been worked out more or less to about four, four pounds per string, which would be um, 12 pounds per unison, right? It's easy to multiply that by uh, 88 notes and you get some sense of how much pressure needs to go on there. The other, so the other part of that is how far down is the soundboard going to sink under that? If it doesn't sink at all, if it doesn't compress, you're going to have a long, thin, sustaining type tone, but no body to it, right? because the impedance is so high. Now, impedance is a big word and it gets thrown around a lot, but basically all it means is that it's fighting motion. When there's a lot of impedance, there's a lot of resistance to motion, right? So, so the soundboard is fighting the sound vibration. Yeah, right. But when, right. It's, when it's singing properly, it's fighting the, sound, the, the mechanical vibrations of the string. It's fighting them in just the right way. But if you have a soundboard that's too thick, it's too heavy, right. it's heavily ribbed, um, it's massive, then the string is not really pushing down on it. I mean, it is, but it's not getting anywhere. It's not compressing that spring. So what you get is a lot of impedance in there. And so that you get a lot of sustain. You don't want to hear it necessarily, but that string is going to vibrate for a long, 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 long time. So obviously that side of the scale is a problem. The other side is a problem too. If a soundboard is made too light, too flexible, uh, you're going to get a big, the impedance is very, very low, too low. You're going to get a huge upfront bang to it, like a snare drum or a cowbell, but no sustain to it. So somewhere in between those things is where the healthiest soundboard is, is going to exist. But nobody's making a soundboard that's a half inch thick today, except maybe Rubenstein's, you know, 12 foot piano. But, and nobody's making a soundboard that's a quarter of an inch thick panel wise. Um, nobody's making soundboards that had ribs that are two inches deep to speak of, and nobody's making them where they're only a quarter of an inch deep either. So typical ribs are about an inch wide, a little less than an inch deep, you know, pretty much I'm generalizing here. Soundboards are more in the three eighths of an inch, uh, vein throughout the panel, a little less than that actually, and then thin down at the edges. The whole point of all of this is it's been terminated. It's been so there's. Out. David or somebody. Go ahead, David. Just that, that there's a global, like fairly small parameter for soundboards, just like there is for actions. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. And the same holds true for guitar That's tops awesome. and violin tops. Uh, you know, these things have been worked out. So we do ourselves a disservice if we depart from that too radically. We do have some latitude. 
Um, you know, I work out rib designs and I work out my own dimensions on the ribs because, I, you know, from the engineering standpoint, I want to have every rib doing the same amount of work as the rib next to it. That's, you know, that's maybe too far afield, but coming around to your bigger question, David, is, is you know, what are we looking for in terms of a, a healthy, a healthy soundboard? So we have to go with the idea that the manufacturer mm -hmm. put something in there that's more or less working. It might not be ideal, uh, all things considered, but it, it's basically working. So I'm looking for bearing. I'm looking for sustain. I'm looking for a uh, crown in the soundboard, right? And that's not so easy to do because you have to climb under the piano sometimes and, yep. and do that. But you can do it even with a one foot ruler. You know, if you get under there just right, you push it up there somewhere, you might see if you see a little bit of a gap there. Obviously, that's a good thing. Uh, that's the most difficult part, though, trying to find out, does this mm -hmm. soundboard have crown in it? And, you know, I've done, we've all done the old, you know, I, I don't want to do it now, and I like crawling on the pianos like that at my age, but used to have the string on a stick and another string on another stick over there, and somehow we managed to get it through the beams and pushed it up and then had a flashlight just right, saw a shadow and all this. That's not very practical, but... Uh, you can also kind of get a sense of it just by looking at it. If the light's just right, you can kind of see, okay, you know, the light shines off a bubble differently than it does off a flat plane. You can get some sense of whether uh, there's, there's crown in there, but those are the big things. I want to see that there's some kind of bearing. Now, rear bearing freaks people out and it should not. Uh, when I went to work for, well, maybe I won't mention names, but... I, I measured sure. a whole <laughs> lot, a whole lot of new bearing on new pianos of various, you know, high-end makes. Yeah. And at least 70% <laughs> of them had either no bearing on the rear or negative bearing on the rear. It wasn't terrible, but it was definitely there. So in that case, if we go back to our bridge here, I didn't think I'd be using this for a bridge. So you have positive bearing coming up, then it crossed over the bridge. And then it went uphill to the rear, rear uh, duplex pump. Wow. So, okay. Where our, in our mind, the model should be this, correct? Yeah. Right? yeah. Or at least flat going off to the duplex pump. But then many of excellent sounding pianos, it goes uphill to the duplex pump. So that's not going to freak me out. That doesn't okay. freak me out. I've, I've seen too many pianos that sound just fine that way. This one, however, is the critical one. This cannot be negative. It can even sort of be flat to a degree, but once it goes this way, there's no, there's nothing you can do with it. I mean, you can make anything a little better, but yeah, I've, that's right. But I, here's the mystery: is I have maintained pianos for decades with old, flat boards that sound great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that 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 sustain and the project and it's like why, why do they? Yeah, well, David, the, do the, these the, do these pianos have negative front bearing? We got to get that out of the way first. Probably it, not. They're flat. They're flat in front. Right, right. And I have. They two. don't. Have, they they they. If they have any uphill at all, they have it on the front. Yeah, right, right. So the it's fact, still pushing down. It's still pushing down on the board. Yeah, the fact that the soundboard looks flat to you, strung, uh, it still has compression. It still has down bearing on it. Like if you were to take all the strings off, you would notice that the crown would increase. So the fact that it's flat and sounds great says that it's still compressed. Maybe not as much as it was new, but that's why you still have. Yeah, soundboard. yeah. But here's the bigger, the bigger question here too. That's David. a great, that's a great answer. The bigger question here too is we would never build a flat soundboard, right? We couldn't build a flat soundboard, thinking that that because we have rebuilt a couple and we've shimmed some boards and and we we have two or three pianos in our care that have quote unquote flat soundboards. So therefore. We must conclude that a flat soundboard is the way to go from now on. And that's not the case, right? We yeah. still have to build crowns in our boards. 
And we still have to approach the whole idea that we want to press that board down by introducing energy into it through downbearing. I mean, that's got to be our model. I would say that, and, and maybe you've seen more of these than I have, but, uh, you know, I've, I've rebuilt pianos, quote unquote, the, the sort of quasi rebuild thing where a board was shimmed, it wasn't too bad. And it maybe had, a, let's just a tiny bit of, of crown that I could see in the bottom of the board, basically flat. And when it came time for me to set the bearing on it, I thought, well, what am I going to do? And years ago, I found out that if I set, you know, not as much as, as I would on a brand new soundboard, but half right. of that at least, right, still came out with a good job. So I wouldn't say that, you know, a board that is flat, if it comes into your shop, for example, and you're wondering what to do, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to have a new soundboard, depending on the money and a lot of other factors. But the basic model is the one that we have to keep in mind because from there we can make departures in our experience and what's acceptable and what's the extreme that we just can't, you know, we can't accept it anymore. I'm going to cut in here real quick. <clears throat> We're about halfway through the session. It's been wow. going really great. Really appreciate your, your time and energy, Easy. Nick. Uh, a couple of things for those folks that are watching on YouTube and Facebook, we're going to sign off those streams. So if you did want to join us on the Zoom chat, I put the link so that you can do that. <clears throat> and then also we've got some questions here in the chat that uh, I think it'd be yeah. great to bring into the conversation. So after uh, I'll deliver maybe the first question <clears throat> and then we'll, we'll sign off YouTube and Facebook. So first of all, I did get a request um, for you to talk about your bread recipes. No, post your bread recipes. Of course, that was tongue in cheek, but clearly it involves a cowbell and a drumstick in some way. So that's fa fascinating. <laughs> but um, we got a question about the bridge surface uh, <coughs> when it's not flat. And it was a question about why do you think this happens when the bridge surface is not flat? Is that something you're, you have an answer to? The bridge surface is not flat. Does that mean front to back it has a kind of a hump in it? I'm not sure what the... What the you know, it's Dave's question, Dave Skolnick, so he might come on in a minute to clarify. I'll move on to the next one, which which may may make more sense. Uh, Vince uh, Mercalo says, is there such Merkel a thing as bridge Merkel roll? Merkel. I'm sorry. Mercalo. Yeah. Oh. Vince Mercalo, dude. <laughs> Miracle, thank you. Uh, is there such a thing as bridge roll? And if so, how does this happen? Ah, good question. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe so. I, I do believe there is soundboard roll, though. The, uh, the forces on the bridge yeah. 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 Are, are such that they want to pull, you know, they want to pull the bridge toward you, the tuner, right? And the only thing that the bridge is really anchored to is the panel and the ribs under it. And if the panel and the ribs in front of the bridge toward you go this way, the bridge is going to cant, is going to cant with it. Usually I've, when I've seen so-called quote unquote bridge roll and, and Vinny's going back a lot of years because this was something that was uh, a big talking point decades ago, more so than it, than it is now. Um, that's what I found. I found out the soundboard itself have, had sine wave. Instead of having a crown like this, it had a, had a sine wave in it. And the bridge had followed the downhill slope of part of that sine wave. So that's a, that's a simple answer to it anyway. Okay, the the cowbell, let me, see, let me show you this. <laughs> All right, a cowbell has virtually uh, no impedance because when I hit it, you hear a little bit of sustain, right? Then it's gone. But this, on the other hand, you'll love this. This is a, a pot. And if I hit this, can you hear that? Oh, that's nice. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Good again. Now, what's the difference between this and the cowbell? is that this has a lot of impedance to it. It's not letting its energy out very quickly. 
taking a long time to let it out. Uh, the same thing with a snare drum, right? That's what I, I'm a drummer, so I, I know this, but a snare drum is just a rat tat tat. There's no sustain in a snare drum, but there's a lot of sustain in a, in a timpani, for example. So we're talking about impedance issues there. So somewhere in between that and this is where our soundboards have to be. And there's the magic is in there only because it's been discovered and worked out through time. Uh, as piano rebuilders, we try and blueprint that and, uh, and work it. You know, the diaphragmizing of a soundboard, the, the full diaphragmizing of a soundboard goes back to Steinway, 1936 or so, somewhere in there when they came out with their little S and little M pianos and the soundboards were diaphragmized all the way from the center, all the way to every edge, including the belly rail edge everywhere from about 320 thousandths of an inch to like a quarter inch everywhere at the edge. And the point of this is really very simple. And virtually all piano builders I know that um, do, do really the nice work, the best work, diaphragmize their soundboard somewhere. Now, if you think about how we understand this in terms of a string. Does a string vibrate completely between two fixed points exactly? No, right? No. Because we know that the mass of the string and the thickness of the string uh, creates, um, in other words, it actually vibrates in from those points just a little bit. The actual vibrating points of a string are not exactly at the A graph, not exactly at the bridge pin. And the thicker the string, the, the, the farther in that moves the actual vibrating points. That's why we have inharmonicity. That's one of the reasons. This, and the soundboard's the same way, if you think about it. So why are ribs scalloped down, for example, right? Somebody answer, somebody answer that, just take a stab at it. Not you, Mikey, I know you know. <laughs> well, because it's too much mass going into the rim, right? And That's right, rib, too much mass are, going into the board. Yeah. So when yeah. the ribs are scalloped Into down the, like that, the board actually, its vibrating point gets closer to the actual rim. The thicker those scallops are, as they get thicker, the vibrating part of the soundboard actually starts to come in towards the middle of the bridge more. Right? Uh, so all diaphragmizing does is follow that same idea. In fact, most of the diaphragmizing that goes down, the th soundboard thinning, if, if diaphragmizing uh, is not a, a word you're familiar with, follows that. So if if you have an eight inch section of a rib scallop, then that same eight inch section is where you're gonna do your, you know, your rib thinning. Pretty much follows that. Now, when you get to the tail of the piano where there's not a rib, that same thing sort of follows though, right around. So at a, at a minimum, an absolute minimum, a good soundboard to me, and we always make in this way, and I know how Mikey does his, uh, as a minimum, the tail of the piano, is thinned and it comes up around the curve and it goes into what I call the treble pocket right there. All of those areas have to be less thick than the middle part of the board. Right, and that's in round terms. So questions, gonna, observations on that? Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me cut in here for some of the questions that got left behind okay. here. So we got through some of the bridge roll questions. So this is a comment from Cy Schuster, but maybe you would have a comment on his comment. He said, the most incredible thing to me about soundboard design is how to predict how much it will deflect when the fully strung. That's gotta be some artistry. Do you have any experiences on that? Oh, like tons. To share? I have, yeah. You know, Rick Wallace is always teasing me. I've got a spreadsheet for that, he'll say. I do have a spreadsheet for that and I can predict it because it's based on beam theory. It's based on dome, you know, how domes react. Because when a soundboard goes into piano, it's not just a curl right? Not just a channel. Uh, when you actually build the board, it looks like it's mostly a channel and it's not actually glued in the piano. When you glue it in though, and you put it in, you're going to find that the high treble area is above the rim by this much. And that down at the tail, it's also above the rim by this much. It's not till we actually glue it in that we push those down. When that happens, the soundboard becomes more of a dome than just a channel. A dome is exceedingly strong compared to, I mean, it's just one of the strongest structures out there, a dome, because any point of pressure radiates in all, all directions. 
So in answer to Sai's uh, question, uh, experience tells us. Mikey knows you know, how much he's going to lose. Now, I shouldn't say lose, but how much of the crown is actually going to be compressed. And we want it. Remember, we want that to happen. We want to compress that spring. So if you start out with, um, if I just throw a number out there, uh, you know, 25 thousandths of downbearing based on the low gauge, and then you string your piano, that 25 thousandths is going to drop down to uh, half that. So maybe 12 or say 15 thousandths. And it happens every time, especially if you're used to making your own boards and you understand what to expect. In terms of quantifying it, however, uh, you'd have to know you'd have to know the thickness of the soundboard. You'd have to know the thickness of the rib, the, the depth of the rib at every rib, and you'd, then you'd have to know the pressure that that we're going to be applying to the soundboard, and they, it can be calculated. And, and I've done it. And also, you have to include the bridge itself, which is considered the last final rib. The bridge itself is massive by comparison. It's a big, strong thing, and that's resisting the downward pressure. So you have to have the bridge in there. You got to have the panel in there. You got to have the rib depths in there in order to be able to calculate how much deflection downward uh, there's going to be. But for the most part, a healthy soundboard that's based basically uh, from what you see out there, Cy, um, it's going to lose, if it starts out healthy and brand new, it's going to lose about a half or a third of what's showing in the unstrung condition. I'll head to the next question. Thank you for that. Next question is from Jim Kelly. Uh, he says, this was a direct message to me. That's why you might not see it in the chat. He said, any thoughts on crescendo punchings from Jurgen? Uh, I have a Yamaha C6 and a Mason Hamlin Grand, both with give and wear on the front key pin punching. Seems like a, a firm bushing would be best. I love Jurgen. And I've used all the different types. And I don't think, for me, there's any particular reason not to use uh, I, I, the, the very old stuff I have, I still have from like, I think it must be literally 50 years ago, is so flimsy and so thought, soft, I would never use it. But the modern stuff that I've seen come out of the usual supply houses um, is reasonable. I want some firmness there. Uh, not everybody likes a really, really firm uh, bottoming out of the key, by the way. Some people like it a little bit more flexible. Uh, to me, the simplest answer, it's a matter of... That's right. And different piano yeah. taste. It's a matter of taste, yeah. Um, so we're running and, out of time. You know, I've, I've, tr yeah. I've yeah. tried the crescendo punchings on a ton of different pianos, and some of them love them. Yeah. Some of them, my fingers love them. And yep. some of my fingers, ew, it's too hard. It's too hard. Too hard a, a landing. Too hard a landing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. One of the other things I want to bring out, it's, it's become axiomatic of a long time ago that everybody knows a hammer needs to get off the string as fast as it can. That was, that was, that was what we all believe. That's what we all taught. The physics of it, though, are different. That the... Um, I mean, that's a half truth at least, right? Uh, so, so we were taught then you got to make sure you needle the, the shoulders and do all this kind of stuff to make the hammer resilient because the hammer's got to, it's got to bounce off that string as soon as it hits it. Well, the reality of the situation is that, and, and the physics of it, this isn't just an opinion. The physics of it are that a hard, hard, hard hammer, imagine a maple hammer, right? That's the one that gets off the string in a hurry, real fast. But you can you tell me what kind of tone are you going to get from a maple hammer? Terrible. Terrible. It's going to be tinny, right? If nothing else, it's going to be tinny, a lot of high partials. What really is happening, and it's supposed to happen when a hammer hits the string, is that it's supposed to flex on the string a certain amount, and then it's supposed to sort of push off. Now, as a drummer, I know this firsthand because, uh, you know, the, the piano is a string instrument. It's also a percussion instrument. The hammer is considered a mallet. So when that mallet hits the string, the physics of it insists that the longer it stays in contact with the string, the more impulse the string is going to get. The more impulse the string gets, the more energy the string gets, 
more energy it gets, the longer it vibrates. Follow that little train there, right? Yep. Now, this is going to be my class, one of my class uh, <laughs> items uh, coming up in March, where I'll flesh this all out. But more energy in the string means it's going to vibrate longer. And David, you talk about bloom and blossom a lot of the time. My theory uh -huh. on this now, and I, I haven't really proved it, but my theory, and I think it's well-founded, is that, see, a string, when it starts to vibrate, it vibrates in its primary plane first, up and down, right? As it, start, as it continues, yeah. it starts yeah. to wobble. And at some point, it's, it's going yeah. sideways. And, it, and it's going to do all this kind of thing, right? Yeah. In the primary plane, the soundboard is most flexible, right? Most flexible. How flexible is a soundboard end to end? Practically none, right? Not, so when the string, not when the that string flexible. Gets, when the string gets it going like this, sideways, yeah. it's basically bumping yeah. into the bass side of the, of the piano and the treble side of the piano with no give to it whatsoever, right? Uh, and with high, high impedance at that point, what's happening? The string, the string is continuing to vibrate and make some sound. So to me, that second bloom, that second sense that it kind of kicked up is when we introduce the proper yeah. resiliency into the hammer so that the string has enough energy to keep going so that eventually when it gets to this point here, it isn't dead. But if it died after doing this, just up and down, you're going to get the first part of the sustain, which is, that's not terrible, but isn't it better if it gets this, and it picks up again. That little exactly sound, right. That little second sound we get is because of this. So the bottom line is that the longer the hammer stays in contact with the string, more impulse is delivered to that string and more sustain and energy is delivered to that string. Now in the treble area, um, where the hammer hits the string, if it stays on the string too long, it becomes a damper at the same time because the, the vibrations are so fast going back and forth that the first vibration of that string off the hammer to the bridge pin and back to the hammer is very much faster than it is down in the lower part of the scale. So if the hammer is lingering up there, dwelling too long, it becomes a damper. And so therefore we start to lose what we think we're gaining. So that's some of the tricks, you know, you know what you're listening for at some point, especially if you're building a hammer up from uh, too, too, not dense enough, like say too soft to something a little harder, you can keep creeping up on it, you know, with your solutions and everything. At some point, you're going to hear just what you need to hear. And then, then you yeah. stop. Yeah, I've cre I creep up on it from the bottom up. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me hit so this anyway, next. Let me hit this next question here yeah. from, yeah. it's also from Jim Kelly. He said, what's the best way to get soft play on a Yamaha C6? Is it a combination of high checking, strong rep string strength and spring strength and a one sixteenth let off? And he follows up saying the piano played well for a classical pianist, but the next pianist in a concert series played hard and changed things. This C6 is in a church with a very talented music director, conservatory train, and wants the piano well regulated. Did that make sense to you, or is that too long? That's kind of long. I'm not <laughs> sure. What, where was the problem? The, the uh, he wants what to get the, the soft, piano? the soft play on a Yamaha, Yamaha C6. Um, right. He he called out three things that he thought would be a good idea: high checking, strong rep, spring strength, and a one sixteenth let off. But did you have any other comments about getting this, a good this, soft play? You see, but this is soft play, checking in soft play is what we're talking about. He wants it to check on soft play? Um, no. No. I think just he to get it, it to, to be, play softly. Yeah, yeah, less bright on soft play. Mm -hmm. The hammers are too bright, is what he's saying. I and yeah, he, he also said that it played well for one pianist, but then another pianist that played hard, it somehow changed things. I'm not sure what that means, but. If this, is too, if this is too specific, we can skip it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what, what, what's intended there in the whole question, and I can't seem to, you know, point them out. But, you know, in, no terms of so, in terms of soft play, uh, if, if it's too bright, assuming that, you know, the whole thing is about shoulders. I mean, that's, that's where everything begins. 
deep shoulder, resilience. The hammer has to flex on that string as it comes up. It's got to go like that, right? In fact, that's my visual. Every time I, I play a hammer, I, I imagine that. And if I hear it's too bright, in my mind, I see it's not doing enough of that. And if it's very, very bright, I imagine it's not doing it at all. And if it's too dull, and I know that there's more to be had because of the plucking thing we talked about earlier, then I know this is happening too much, right? And therefore, yeah. I've got to stiff the shoulders so it's not doing it too much. So assuming the shoulders are properly, uh, you know, done on a soft blow, uh, almost everything is at the top of the hammer. It's just a, an attack that has to be chopped, chopped, needled out. That's basically that's a soft, that's a quick answer, quick answer on that. Okay, I'm putting some links in the chat. We're about five minutes out from ending. I put a link in there for the convention if you want to join the convention. Nick, as he said, will be joining us to teach a, a class. And um, maybe he can follow up with a little bit more detail on that. Uh, we put a link for a feedback form in there. And then I'm also going to put a link in the chat if you want to sign up so that you can get the recordings of these radio hours in our member area and make sure you get a direct link every week. Um, just you, you touched upon it briefly, but any other thoughts about what you think you'll, you'll talk about at the upcoming convention? Well, I want to delve into that whole business about the hammer um, impact business because I have a lot of uh, different slides to show on that. I've got a few videos to show on that and I really want to, I really want to drive it home. And, you know, I've been talking with you, Ethan. About you want to change, in other words, you want to change the conventional wisdom, Nick? <laughs> how, how dare you, bro? <laughs> well, you're right. You're right. That's, that's a brash thing to do. I, I, maybe I won't be there, Ethan. I'll just, I'll just cop out. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so I want to I want to do that. Uh, no, I, don't, I have a video here. I should real quick if I can do this. Awesome. Share screen. And let me just see something here. If I've got it. I can see your screen. Looks pretty good so far. Okay, good, good. Uh, uh, and I can see it just fine. I can see your presentation. If you uh, Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. That, that's, that's a compressibility, but I had a video somewhere that I just wanted to show. Remember I was talking about, uh, the longer, the longer a force stays in contact with the thing it's, it's forcing. The more it's impulsive. Off, right. right. Yes. Yeah. Um, the more yeah. energy is delivered to the string. <clears throat> I've got a short thing here. I could just show. okay, this is it right here. This is a bowed, this is motion in slow motion of a bowed violin string. Now, it looks like nothing's happening, but it's slow, slow motion here. And if you watch this string right here, you can begin to see, you can begin to see it segmenting. You see that? Can you expand the size of that by any chance? Uh, yeah. Okay, it's okay. Let, okay. Let, me, let me get rid of this on top here. Uh, it's good enough. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Now you see it moving. You see how it's segmenting. In ah, there? there you go. But, but do you also yeah. see how the fundamental is working? So in other words, uh, the partials are, are really kicking in, but the longer that this bow is in contact with a steady force on this string, the more energy is delivered to this string to the point where later on, it's almost hitting this one. So I'm just going to sort of fast forward with this. Look at that. Wow. Uh, yeah. and no, it's no. really, really that. moving side to side. Oh, my God. And, and that's simply because a, a sustained force was delivered to this string. And the physics say the longer that a force is in contact with an object, the more energy is delivered to that object. That's the physics of our hands. Wow. Hammer. Off too. Now, when when the bow is taken away, it starts to slow down, and you can see that the the uh, partials go away first because they have all the partials have less energy in them than the fundamental, and at the very end, you can see that it's mostly the fundamental, right? Mostly the length yeah. of the the whole string. Also, if you look closely, you can see there's a sort of jump rope thing going on there. Yeah. 
Oh so yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of rotating a little bit. Kind of a jump rope, right? Well, piano strings do the same thing. So that gets to what I was talking about uh, about earlier. So I want to flesh that out a little more. Well, and I need to get, get back to you. Yeah, you need to you need to give the the value you gave us today was massive. So I'm gonna aggressively entreat you to come on for another radio hour and give us another hour of yeah i'd love to come back insane. in fact i spoke with uh, ethan um the, the this format lends itself to a mini tech in a fantastic way because little bite-sized pieces of information now we've covered a lot of broad areas here in a broad way but uh, little mini techs would fit right in here beautifully and i'd love to do that too so i know it would I'm thinking about bringing recorded stuff and live stuff to my class at that, that conference. So Good. we're going to see what's happening. Awesome. Anyway, brother, thank you so much for this. Yes. This was, that was my pleasure. fantastic. Yeah. And there's a ton more questions that you have to answer. So you, know, yeah. you owe well, it to all these dudes and dudettes to come back. So do I hang out here for a while and... Or no, I, I mean, it's... we can uh, pretty much what we do is we just try to call it an hour for You're the sake of up. everybody's uh, efficient schedule, you know, so I'll, uh, I, I basically just log us off. And, uh, and then if you and I need to be in touch or something like that, then yeah, we have, have a phone call or something like that. But um, yeah, that's, that's our radio hour. And, and man, you packed it, you packed it tight. And you really, you really decided to just awesome blow our minds there at the end you know right 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 when we thought it was over that was a great great to bring that video in and, and you successfully well, actually yeah, showed the video the having through. not having not practiced that yeah, so yeah appreciate that up. that was a big thing i wanted to make bring sure that, that off uh, or <laughs> has been enlightened that was that was that was mind-blowing but you gave little tidbits all the way through the hour little like fuck that's really a good idea I never thought about that before. God damn. That's really good. All the way through the hour, that was happening for me. So, all right. Really good. Great. Thank good, you good. so much. Good to know. Good to hear. Thank you. This and this my is my pleasure. Thanks this for the is, invite. Thanks for the invite. This is the. Hey, un- my pleasure. This is the unbleeped version of Piano Tech Radio Hour for sorry for yeah. Best yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah, the unbleeped yeah, version. Yeah, right. David Tech Anderson does have a way to Dude, you're, you're, you're named. Yeah, yeah. Your name has you. been on my list since Radio Hour started. Yeah. So Ethan finally nabbed you. I'm so happy. Yeah, really, really privileged and appreciate it so much. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, everyone. All well, right, boys. We're going to sign off. Thank you so much. Have a lovely right. day, and we'll see you next week. Next time. Beautiful weekend. Bye bye, right. everyone. Bye. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.